Welcome to State Senator Bill Dodd's latest in a series of virtual town halls on the corona, not on the coronavirus epidemic. Tonight's uh, topic in partnership with KSUI and Sonoma TV is emergency and wildfire preparedness. I'm Rick Wynn, one of the volunteer hosts on KSUI 91.3 FM in Sonoma. This evening's town hall is being presented on all our platforms, including Sonoma TV, Comcast Channel 27 in the Sonoma Valley. SonomaTV.org, the Sonoma TV channel on YouTube, and of course, KSVY 91.3 in the Sonoma Valley and streaming on KSVY.org and on your smart home device. Tonight's event features three distinguished panelists talking about the state's preparation and response to emergencies, especially wildfires. We'll address issues including current emergencies, notifications, evacuations, public safety power shutoffs, resilient utilities, and what still needs to be done to make our state safe, state safe. Our panelists will take your questions starting at about 6.30. The studio call-in number is 707-933-9133. That's 707-933-9133. But remember, we won't be answering the phones till about 6.30. Senator Bill Dodd represents all or part of six North Bay counties, including Napa, Sonoma, Solano, Contra Costa, Sacramento, and Yolo counties. And now I turn it over to Senator Dodd, who will make opening remarks and introduce the panel. Senator? Thanks very much, uh, Rick. Really appreciate uh, KSVY from convening this latest in a series of town halls. Uh, this is the 13th since the pandemic started. Tonight, of course, we're going to be talking about wildfire and emergency preparedness. Uh, and I would like to, uh, uh, you know, thank our panelists for being here tonight. This is a very distinguished group. And of course, just as a matter of uh, personal privilege, uh, these three people have a very special place. Uh, I think, uh, you know, certainly in every uh, Californian's heart, but also uh those in uh, in Napa that have been affected by the fires. I started working with uh, Director Mark Gilarducci uh, going back in 2015 when I was an assembly member and the, the fires uh, there in, uh, in Lake County. And uh, President Batcher, president of the California Public Utilities Commission, she's been an amazing uh, leader in turning that big organization around. I've really appreciated her accessibility and and personal friendship as well. And of course, Alfredo Pedroza, the chair of the Napa County Board of Supervisors, uh, a good friend uh, for, as a former Napa County supervisor, really appreciate the work that he's done. And I want to thank the hundreds of people turning tuning in tonight. Uh, the fact that you're here shows your concern. And we're going to take your email questions and open the phone lines for your calls at 6.30. And that call-in number is 707-933-9133. Now, before we get into our main discussion tonight, just an uh, update on the COVID-19 pandemic. The Delta variant is fueling a surge of hospitalizations. The number of people hospitalized has more than doubled statewide since late July. Data shows the vast majority of those getting infected are unvaccinated. Please do your part to fight the spread and keep your family safe. It's critical to get vaccinated and observe public health guidelines. Don't believe anybody who tells you that vaccines don't work. They do. And, you know, while we're at it, wear your mask in public. Let's protect each other from each other and get through this thing once and for all. But on to tonight's topic. Driven by climate change, Devastating wildfires are now all too common in the state of California. Last year, we set a record with nearly 10,000 fires, destroying 4.2 million acres. And this year, we're off to an equally devastating start. The Dixie Fire that we keep hearing so much about is raging in the northern, Calif northern Sierras and is now the second most destructive fire in state history. There are many factors that are driving the increase in wildfires. Climate is just one of them. Drought is compounding the problem as water supplies dry up. But as we have seen, our utility companies are partly responsible. Electrical equipment sparked the 2018 campfire, the most destructive fire in state history, killing 85 people. 
clearly these companies must do better. We will make them do better. But in addition to better managing our utilities, we must better manage our forest. And I'm really incredibly proud that Governor Newsom and the legislature this year approved a more than $1 billion wildfire prevention package that will include building fire breaks and doing control burns in our wildlands. The investment adds to wildfire safety and prevention measures I've been working on over the last four years. Still, wildfires will happen, and we must be prepared for them along with other major disasters, such as earthquakes. Evacuations, public safety power shutoffs, and smoky skies are all part of this unfolding reality. Improving our response, though, is key. Now, here tonight are three people to talk about what we're doing to keep people safe and give their outlook on the wildfire season. The state's uh, director of Cal California's governor of Office of Emergency Services, Mark Gilarducci, has led the California response to all to all manner of disaster since he was appointed by Governor Jerry Brown in 2013. A lot has happened on Mark's watch. He has been at the forefront of our response to fires in the pandemic, and we'll hear from him in a moment. Uh, Maribel Batcher was appointed president of the California Public Utilities Commission by Governor Gavin Newsom in 2019. In her role, she leads an agency charged with regulating public utilities, including electrical utilities, telecommunications, natural gas, and water companies. Among her priorities has been to help improve safety practices at these companies and make sure they aren't causing more disasters. And we have Alfredo Pedroza, who is chair of the Napa County Board of Supervisors, is keenly aware of the threat of wildfires and earthquakes at the local level as well as what needs to be done to improve our responses. He is a lifelong Napa resident who was appointed to the Board of Supervisors by Governor Brown in 2014, interestingly enough, to take my spot when I was elected to the California State Assembly. So welcome, thank you all for being here. We're gonna start with Director Gilarducci, you're on. Well, thank you, Senator, and, and uh, also my uh, fellow members on the panel. Great to be with you tonight. Um, you know, I, I just really want to um, highlight your, your comments about what we're facing uh, uh, in these climate-related or climate-driven uh, challenges, these, the disasters that we're seeing um, amplified by warm weather and drier conditions. Uh, we have drought now in California, uh, more than 85% of California is in a, um, what we call an extreme drought condition. Uh, and, and, and these are conditions that are uh, resulting in a, uh, a higher degree of potential for wildfire. We also are seeing warmer weather. We've actually had uh, more hot days. Uh, in fact, it's been the hottest year yet recorded uh, uh, that we've had. And uh, between the, the these uh, hot days, uh, the drought, uh, the fuel moisture uh, is down to almost zero in many, many spots. And that, of course, uh, creates a tremendous threat of wildfires, which now is a year-round uh, threat. Used to have be seasonal, but we're seeing uh, wildfires now really on a year-round basis. Uh, in fact, over the last four years, California has experienced seven of the 10 largest wildfires ever recorded in state history. If you think about that, it's a phenomenal statistic about the, you mentioned my 13, you're exactly right. It has really been a nonstop uh, 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 number of wildfires, but we've also had, as you said, you know, droughts and earthquakes and, and floods and many other kinds of disasters. Um, in 2020 alone, uh, wildfires burned a record of 4.2 million acres in one year, damaging or destroying more than 10,000 homes, individuals. So this is a serious matter. Uh, it's a deadly situation. Uh, and it's something that we all have to work for and work towards. In fact, right now we have 11 major fires burning in Northern California. You mentioned the Dixie fire, which is obviously the most complicated and impactful. Uh, it's, it's the second largest uh, single fire uh, in our history now at this point. And uh, unfortunately we've lost a number of communities again 
Uh, the, 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 the entire town of Greenville, uh, unfortunately, has been lost. Um, and, you know, we're seeing this more and more. And we, we need the public to be our, our partners in fire prevention, uh, in our ability to buy down the risk. Uh, you have to understand that when the winds start blowing, uh, it's not uncommon that, that a fire can get started and then embers can be blown further out, uh, maybe a mile or two ahead of the fire, which is uh, where you may not think, you know, you're far away enough from a fire. But I, I just got briefed just not more than 15 minutes ago uh, where we were, where I was told that on the Dixie fire right now uh, with the winds, we have spotting uh, uh, almost four miles out ahead of the fire. It's almost an unheard of. Uh, kind of thing. And that fire was picked up by air attack and uh, it, it rapidly grew to 10 acres in just a short amount of time. So we need to uh, be prepared. Uh, and uh, part of that is uh, being able to uh, work to, um, uh, you know, harden your home and uh, understand uh, uh, the uh, uh, evacuation orders, uh, evacuation timing. And, uh, um, and, and if you're told to, to move out, we want people to move out. And, and as you'll learn from tonight, from uh, myself and other speakers, um, being prepared for uh, fire, when you don't think it may not happen in your community, you're probably wrong. Uh, California is a wild fire prone state. And there's there's not too many communities I've, I've not been to within the state where we haven't seen a wildfire. Let me close by saying, we also are working with utilities, as, as you mentioned, Senator, um, because of the, uh, potential for wildfire uh, ignition from utility equipment. Um, this this whole concept of public safety power shutoffs uh, have been introduced. And uh, in fact, uh, tomorrow, uh, PG&E will be actually instituting a public safety power shutoff in 18 counties in Northern California. Uh, and this will be something that will start at about 8 p.m. tomorrow night and will we'll end about 3 p.m. on Wednesday. And the idea there is to um, strategically shut the power down uh, to prevent uh, additional wildfires because we are going to have a big wind event uh, coming in the next uh, 24 hours. That not only could start new fires, but it certainly can make the existing fires much worse. And so uh, strategically, uh, uh, Cal OES and Cal Fire and all of the public response agencies are working hard to make sure we have resources in place and we have people out of harm's way. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, President Batcher, welcome. Mary Bell, you're on mute. I have too many papers in front of me. I couldn't get to my keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Senator. And it's really an honor this evening to join you and um, virtually and um, certainly uh, be here alongside Director Gilarducci and Chair Pedroza. So I really do uh, thank you and I'm honored. Um, as, as Mark, uh, Director Gilarducci said, the, and, and as Senator Dodd said, the California Public Utilities regulates the state's investor owned utilities, um, electric, water, gas, et cetera. And pg e is obviously one of those that we are responsible for in terms of how well they are operating the grid. Their responsibility is to operate it safely and reliably, and um, their customers are to be held at the highest priority within that um, configuration. This responsibility includes um, ensuring that they're doing everything in their power to avoid their power lines igniting wildfires. That's not only um, the law, it's also regulations. Um, since joining the PUC in 2019, I, like you uh, in the audience, have witnessed the devastating impacts that catastrophic wildfires cause, as well as public safety power shutoffs that um, Californians have endured. These events have defined and prioritized much of my work and that of my um, colleague, Director Gilarducci at the CPUC this last year, uh, last, I'm sorry, over last uh, almost two years, Mark, can you believe that? Um, as, as Director Gilarducci mentioned, as Senator Dodd mentioned, climate change is significantly impacting California. Um, our wildfire season is longer, it's more intense, 
This year, as has been noted, we have already had over 6,000 wildfires that have burned over a million acres in California, and it's only mid-August. Um, the Dixie fires, as been noted, has already burned over half a million acres, making it the second largest wildfire. It's actually the first, if you don't consider that the August, uh, August uh, wildfire several years ago was a complex uh, fire, but in our state, there are hundreds of acres of wildland urban interface. This means that the utility, all of the utilities, really is infrastructure must pass through areas that are increasingly fire prone as Californians face worsening drought conditions and other climate induced uh, situations. At the CPUC, we are focused on ensuring that the utilities are taking aggressive action to prevent their infrastructure from sparking a wildfire. Our efforts benefit greatly, have been benefited greatly from the partnership that Director Ghirlarducci and I enjoy along with CAL FIRE and the Office of Energy Infrastructure Safety now located at the Natural Resources Agency. Together with our sister agencies and the legislature, we are driving the utilities to reduce the risk of utility caused wildfires through better weather forecasting and modeling and safety maintaining uh, their, their infrastructure, their electrical infrastructure. Now every year, the utilities must submit a wildfire mitigation plan, which describes how they will reduce wildfire risk on their system through measures like extensive vegetation management and grid hardening that targets the most at-risk circuits. I'm grateful for the expertise of the Office of the Infra Infrastructure Safety formally at the CPUC as the Wildfire Safety Division, which reviews these plans and provides guidance to the utilities on where their efforts must rapidly focus and mature. One of the other tools that is available to the utilities to prevent catastrophic wildfires is to shut off the power to its customers, as many in the audience know all too well. The utilities have statutory authority to turn off the power when doing so will protect public safety. Each utility must make the decision to turn off power based on hazards on the grid, of the grid, weather conditions, the flammability of local vegetation, and many other factors. I will add to these factors, we have this year and last added to the requirements before they shut off the power, they must take into consideration um, also what impacts such, uh, such take turning off the power will do to the public. What kind of health dangers, what kind of serious situation for uh, individual customers? It's not only a measurement of the grid, it's a measurement of the impact of public safety on human beings. So that is another thing that they will have to report 10 days out to us at the PUC, what they have learned, what they considered, and how they considered it. And that will inform us as we move forward uh, to ever increase our, and, and be more um, specific, if you will, about our guidelines, which they must follow. There have been some improvements along the way. I think uh, Director Gerlarducci would uh, agree with that. Um, there's much that needs to still be done. And we meet regularly with the um, IOUs. Um, we have, I'll just say it, we have truly um, micromanaged them since the devastating year of 2019, where frankly, they all felt terribly uh, off the wagon, if you will, in terms of how they notified people, how they liaisoned with the counties and the tribes, um, how they notified telecommunications companies. We did a full assessment of them and really have been holding their hand closely on improvements um, in many, many parts of, of what they do in, in terms of mitigation of wildfire, as well as how they manage a situation um, that is, is going to necessitate a PSPS. I won't go through all the improvements made by pg &E. It might come up in the question and answer period. I don't wanna overspeak my time here, Senator Dodd, but I can uh, illustrate some of the things they've done in terms of community resource centers, wildfire mitigations. I can talk to our PSPS guidelines um, that have increased what they must do 
So, and and then I think both Director Gilarducci and I can talk a little bit about tree removal because I know that's been um, a source of, of concern in both Napa and Sonoma counties as well as a couple other areas. And we also have to, uh, both Mark and I concern ourselves frequently with how well uh, the coordination goes uh, between the pg and &E in this case and the telecommunications companies. That has also been a struggle. And it's, it's again, goes right to the heart of public safety. If you don't know the fire's coming, if you can't um, get a, a clear signal through your cell phone and, and you can't talk to um, first responders, then you're endangered. So we've worked hard on that as well. So with that, Senator, I'll turn it back to you. And I'm sorry, I was a little long-winded. No, no, that's great. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Now we're going to move to Chairman of the Board of Supervisors for Napa County, Alfredo Pedroza. Thank you, Senator, and to my colleagues on the panel, thank you. It's a tough act to follow, uh, but to Director Garducci, if you remember, we were walking on Atlas Peak Road after that 2017 fire, and you said a phrase that resonated. You know, every disaster is local. And, and, and I take that also to mean that, you know, prevention has to be local as well. And I think counties and individual property owners have done a lot. And I think that's the one message I really want to convey. While we're in the middle of fire season, so much has changed since 2017, just in Napa County. And I just want to give that perspective. A lot of it has been made uh, based off of support that we've received from the state and federal government. But in terms of what we've learned and what Napa County is doing, it's kind of a three-pronged approach. The first part is a recognition that it can't just be about suppression. It has to be about prevention. And what can you do in that space meaning? meaningfully to really effectuate the way the fuels are in your community. And one of the things that we did in Napa was we created this community uh, wildfire protection plan, the CWPP, working with the Firewise Council in Napa County. It's a volunteer board, 501c3, comprised of former firefighters, vintners, local stakeholders. They came together working with County Fire and Cal Fire to create a five-year plan of how we're going to create strategic fire breaks fuel reduction projects in Napa County. Um, to no surprise, that's a $42 million sticker price of what it costs to do those projects. Uh, but it's projects that really took into account the risk benefit of investing these taxpayer dollars in our community. Um, and what the board did to really demonstrate that we can't wait to kind of the urgency that both Maribel and Mark talked about, you know, we front loaded $6.4 million to get some of those projects done now. Uh, and it's really creating an opportunity to showcase why fuel breaks matter and really illustrating the difference of here's what the conditions were before, here's what the conditions are after. And once you demonstrate that, the public really understands the benefits of why we have to go in and manage a force. And quite honestly, you have to remove trees for the benefit of creating these strategic fire breaks. Again, uh, we've done some work already in advance of this fire season, you know, in at-risk communities. But again, that's a five-year plan that talks about projects that we have to go in and do, remove fuel load and create fire breaks. Again, $42 million. Now, while we've been doing that, we've been also uh, doing um, a chipping program where we go and we recognize that for those communities that have resources that uh, landowners can go in and remove their own and create their own defensible space, that's great. But there are communities where we have landowners that don't have the resources to go and create that defensible space. So we create a program where we will go and chip that fuel load for them. Uh, we Just this year, we've completed 695 requests. And, and to the point that I think uh, Director Garducci illustrated, while you think your home may be safe, when you have those wind conditions and that ember travels, that's when defensible space around your home matters, right? And that's why it's so critical to make these upfront investments around chipping and defensible space. Now, you know, we've lost around 1,500 homes. And uh, we've learned along the way. So one of the things that we have done as people are rebuilding their homes, we really work with them to say, you know, how can we help you rebuild a little bit more resiliently, right? So creating ember resistant zones, hardening your home, recognizing that that might come at a cost, but what type of funding can we provide to offset that? Again, when someone loses their home, it's also an opportunity to maybe rebuild a little bit more resiliently. So we pass some local ordinances around that. And then on the suppression side, you know, everyone loves, uh, you know, those nice aircraft that come and drop the red powder and drop water. It's critical. It's part of what needs to happen. But we also recognize that when the whole state is burning and where there's multiple incidents throughout the state, it's hard to prioritize resources. And 
I'll speak very singularly. When it's an incident in Napa, Napa County is the most important county. Uh, but when you wear a regional hat, you have to prioritize your region. So Napa County, um, we are contracting uh, to have a dedicated uh, helicopter in Napa County uh, that will be based at our airport. And it has a capacity, I think, to drop, you know, 900 gallons of water within seconds. Uh, you know, that's coming at a cost of $1.8 million for Napa County. Uh, and that's real money, but it's an investment uh, in our community of recognizing we know the outcomes we're trying to avoid, but it's also having those local resources to augment the hand crews that the state has made available to augment the upstaffing we're doing with our local volunteer firefighters and career firefighters. Then lastly, a little bit on the technology side, um, you know, it's one of those things when you have an incident that happens at three in the morning, you know, how quickly does it get reported? And what we've learned is the quicker you get an incident reported, the quicker you potentially can get resources to it. So we are working with private sector companies to augment the cameras that pg e has installed, that CAL FIRE has installed, that OES has installed, to try to potentially detect fires a little quicker and sooner um, using artificial intelligence. Again, it's using 21st century technologies to try to identify fires quicker. Uh, and then lastly, on the communication front, Zone Haven, one of the things that we've learned is when you have to evacuate and you have to communicate in a crisis, you need some pretty robust communication tools. So we've really implemented some technologies where we identify neighborhoods by zone to try to make evacuations a little bit more orderly and a little bit safer and a little bit more predictable. That's with uh, the men and women of you know the sheriff's department. So that in a nutshell is kind of what we've done. And look, we're also doing some low tech um, things like grazing. Uh, there are things that livestock can do to minimize fuel loads and we're trying to create pilot programs to do some of that. So yes, we have to do the helicopter for suppression. Uh, we have to do meaningful prevention work, not just in a one-time fashion. Once you have these fire breaks, you have to keep doing them and sustaining those fire breaks. And then it's using technology to try to identify fires a little quicker, to support CAF fire, to get resources uh, to those areas a little quicker. But as what we've illustrated today, Senator, it's not, it's not just the federal responsibility of the state, it's local and individual property owners all rowing in the same direction for the benefit of our communities. And Madam President, I, I think, uh, you know, the PSPS are good. Uh, always continuing to evaluate the criteria is always important. But if we want to prevent those outcomes that we all want to prevent, it means we have to get a little uncomfortable with some of these things for a short period of time uh, because we know the conditions are high risk out there. But again, really appreciate, Senator, your support. As a former supervisor, you get what we go through at a local level, and you've always gone to bat for us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor. Appreciate uh, your perspective. Uh, I think that the uh, Director Gilarducci also had another uh, phrase out there that he's been working with that I've heard many times, whether he's in Napa County, Lake County, Sonoma County, Yolo County, Solano County with all the local elected officials, it gets everybody together, one team, one fight. We've appreciated that director more than you know. Thanks, Senator. All right, yeah. Rick, you're on. <laughs> well, we have we have a plethora of questions um, and we have some live questions coming in and I think we'll start with that. And we have Ken on line one from Vacaville, question on forest management and emergency notifications. Ken, you're on. Ken, you're on. Hello, you're Ken. You're sitting next to, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, with, thank you, Senator Dodd. Um, with Mr. Gerarducci sitting next to Mr. Pedroza, at least electronically, please have a conversation. The warning system, the emergency notification system for Napa County is a model. Solano County, not so much. Uh, if uh, Mr. Gerarducci, if you could standardize the emergency notifications for counties, it would be very helpful. Uh, the um, fires that we had, the campfires you recall, were uh, disastrous in Santa Rosa because it occurred at one o'clock in the morning and the warning system was knocking on doors. If um, an electronic version of that with Mixel works, but my phone's not on at one o'clock in the morning, it doesn't. There's a tsunami siren system that the coast uses for, for that. Why can't we have something like that for the off hours or those of us who do not have access to electronic uh, alerts? 
Who would like to take that? So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start. This is Mark. Um, great question. Thanks for bringing it up. And, and uh, let me start off by saying that Napa is a great model. Uh, what's happening in Napa uh, is you know, I'd love to see happen in communities throughout the state. Um, they have learned uh, in Napa from previous disasters. That's that's the first that's the first uh, good thing. You have to learn from from the past. You're applying it uh, to the future, and and they have um, implemented and designed some uh, very innovative projects, like uh, the high low sirens um, uh, that the sheriff Robertson uh, implemented and worked. We worked together. Uh, Senator Dodd and and uh, the Higher Patrol Commissioner to change the law to allow those high low sirens to be put on uh, police cars and sheriff's cars so that uh, and they can only be used to identify for evacuation. So for people who may not have uh, their phones on, they could they could uh, uh, get that 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 sound um, and and be um, notified that they needed to at least turn on their phone or or um, uh, take an action. Uh, we also have the WIA, which is the Wireless Emergency Alert System, which which is designed uh, to uh, uh, activate your phone even if it's off and and uh, be able to uh, get an alert out. Um, and we have standardized since the 17 uh, fires, the, the big fires in Sonoma and Napa, uh, where um, you're correct, uh, the, 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 there was a lot of discoordination with regards to from county to county. Um, what we did is we went back and we implemented a standardized terminology scheme and uh, put that in the government code. Uh, now uh, you you have either an evacuation order, uh, you have an evacuation warning, or a shelter in place order. And so um, all of the law enforcement and fire uh, and emergency management organizations in the state are using the same terminology to standardize across the state. Um, and uh, they are part of that plan comes with how best to um, uh, and when to use each one of those particular orders uh, or designations. And, um, and then lastly, we've left it up to each county uh, to be able to use the provider that they choose uh, uh, best suited for them. In the case of Napa County, they, they may use Nixell. Uh, in other counties, they may use something else but they have to use these terms within that system so that it's standardized across the board. I would say we're not 100% exactly where we want to be. We're, we're, as technology gets better uh, and as, as um, uh, more of this capability gets implemented like the high lows across the state, uh, we'll continue to get as standardized as possible. But we've, th we've taken a big leap ahead since the 2017-18 uh, fires. Thank you. I want to come back to that um, with another question, but we, uh, Donna's been holding for quite a while from Napa. She's formerly from Angwin, and she has a question about old power transformers. Donna? Hello? Hello, you're on. Donna, you're on. Okay. So we had lived in Angwin for many years, and I don't know what year the pole, the power pole had been put in, but it was showing alarming signs of age. And I kept calling pg &E, telling them I thought it needed to be replaced. So after the fire last year, they finally replaced it. And their parting message to me was, now you don't have to worry about it sparking. The new ones don't spark. Well, I had no idea that I should have been worrying about it sparking. And uh, previous to that, a few months before that, in the street next to us, a transformer had actually fallen to the ground and started a fire. And luckily, it was during the middle of the day, and they jumped on that and got it put out. So my question is, what's the condition with transformers? Does pg &E have a responsibility to replace those? And how many have they not investigated? How many more are there old, just like ours was. I think I can probably take a swing at that one. Um, Donna, thank you. Um, and you're so right. Part of you appointed, you put your finger right on part of our problems uh, with PG&E, and that is an aged 
uh, infrastructure. And <clears throat> since their um, poor performance, if you will, in 2019 with, um, with uh, us, the regulator, as well as other emergency manage managers and local government, we have instituted several things. The legislature has, and we have in, been in partnership. They must have a welfare mitigation plan put forward. And in so doing, they have to also re, um, discuss what they're doing with their infrastructure. So that would include the kinds of things that you mentioned, um, transformers, that includes fuses. Uh, there are two types of fuses. There's exempt and non-exempt fuses. Uh, exempt tend not to spark as much as the non-exempt. So we're insisting that they go through, they replace that. They're hardening the system overall. One of the th main things that um, they are doing is covered conductors. Now that sounds fancy. All that truly is, is covering the electrical wire. So that it's less likely, still could be, but less likely that it will contribute to sparking and igniting a fire. Um, they are in the multi-year plan of replacing transformers to more modern transformers, their poles, their towers. Um, you might remember in the um, campfire, it was discovered that one of those towers was over 100 years old. So this is all shocking. It's shocking to the regulator, it's shocking to the general public and the customers, shocking to the legislature, um, and of course, the local governments. So they are under um, various plans and, ex and executions of those plans to harden their entire system. Um, part of that also is undergrounding electrical lines. There, um, in the Sierra Nevada, particularly some uh, that are difficult, and that will be difficult to do, but that's in the menu of things that we want the IOUs to consider and are considering. One of the ways we hold their feet to the fire, no bad pun intended, um, is we have to approve their general rate cases. That gives them essentially the budget to pay for things. And we also have to approve whether or not they have prudently spent that budget. They might do something that we go in after the fact and review whether or not they can get paid for that, frankly. And we, can, we will find they didn't do it responsibly um, and prudently. And they have to meet those, those types of uh, judgments by the regulator. So um, you're right, they have all aged infrastructure. They're underway in, in um, mitigating, mitigating wildfires by updating the infrastructure. Um, but there are millions of, of miles that they have to do. That's not, I'm not making an excuse for them, they have to do it. Public safety is at risk. So um, I'm sorry that you had to call them so often before they replaced uh, extremely helpful, but it's a combination of them all. You want the right fuse, you want the right um, hardening of, of the wires, you want the right vegetation management, the clearance under the wires. So if there is a spark, it doesn't ignite um, the terrible dry fuel load that we have throughout the state right now. So Don, I hope that at least explained a few things to you. I think and Donna, a follow up question. Rick, if oh, I may just sorry, real quick, just for Donna, if, if you've already notified one of the supervisors, just let us know, Donna, so we can have that knowledge locally about that. No problem. Um, John Varaco from Woodland asked, my question is about overseeing PG&E's maintenance program for the rights of ways and equipment. Who in our state government is overseeing these areas? I, I believe you just answered that. Um, we we uh, do. Who in our Rick, state government is holding PG? PG needs management and the board of directors accountable. That is you, right? Yes, we do. And we hold them accountable both um, in law and regulation and in some of our proceedings. pg and &E in particular is being held accountable on some of the safety issues um, that came out of the bankruptcy, part of the bankruptcy plan. Um, their senior executives must be held accountable for safety and per our um, our our safety lines, as well as what's in their wildfire mitigation plans. And indeed, some of their executive compensation is linked to that since, since our procedure that approved the bankruptcy. Um, there's, I, as you can imagine, a lot of the questions that were submitted earlier have to do with PG&E. 
Um, we have Olivia on line two from Sacramento, and she has a question on evacu evacuation orders. Of prisons for evacuation orders, and I feel that this is particularly concerning in our area, um, particularly with regard to CMS, where, uh, in, uh, where residents have in the past, just last year, been exposed to terrible conditions inside during last August's fire. Um, and where there are many people who have respiratory illnesses that, if exacerbated, could leave them more vulnerable to COVID-19. Um, so my question is, uh, Ms. Uh, Director Gilarducci, your office is responsible for overseeing emergency response in the state, and your view, uh, your website claims that your values consist of compassion and concern for all. So my question is, what do you intend to do to prevent catastrophes like this from happening in the future and ensure that those commitments extend to all Californians, um, including those who have been left behind in the past. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, thanks, Olivia. And I, I appreciate the question. Um, and I, you know, in thank you, and thank everybody for taking the time this evening. Those of us in the fire zones uh, pay close attention to everything that's going on. Back in April of this year, uh, Newsom, Governor Newsom announced, I think it was $520 million that was going to be appropriated to CAL FIRE for new equipment, aircraft, and human power. In June, this money was, uh, without much press, uh, didn't make it uh, to CAL FIRE. And I just kind of want to know, uh, there's thousands of us in the fire zone that kind of want to know what happened to that money. And especially when we hear now that Cal Fire needs more staff and more equipment, I'll take my answer on the uh, on the uh, air. Thanks. I think I've had that down by now. Um, at any rate, I'll I'll give give that a try. When the governor starts out with his budget, um, you know it's a give and take. The, the legislature has their. Uh, uh, actions that they want to do. They've, we've got our teams in the Senate, our budget teams, and this uh, budget teams, in, you know, in the Assembly. And um, you know, frankly, I wasn't aware of that specific. That same charge was leveled at the governor for uh, fire prevention money. One of the things I've noticed, though, that in the May the May revise, the governor, you know, comes up after looking at all. You know, the money, at least at the time that's come in, how that money can all be programmed and we'll get advice. And then from there, the, you know, the, the exercise is working with the legislature to see what's going to be done. And if it was a budget item to say, OK, we're budgeting now for new fire trucks and those type of things, the, you know, Right, right away, a lot of these things, particularly on fire prevention, we're not going to get done. The capacity of the state right now still is not yet what it should be on an annual basis because we just started revving up in this area. What I think probably in 2018, we had a bill that made it that revved up the amount of prevention and in 19 and 20. And here we are, uh, you know, looking out now towards. 21. So it's, it's awful easy to look at those things and say that uh, that money uh, was pulled back. The fact of the matter is, is you may very well see that money being programmed in other areas. And so uh, if you could maybe even on the chat or some item, we'd be happy to chase that down. But by and large, I've really been impressed with the administration and their willingness to look at all things prevention suppression, whatever it takes to uh, get the job done. And I know that Director Gil Gilarducci probably has some more specifics that he could uh, offer. Um, thanks, Senator. I mean, um, I, I, I don't know about specifically the $520 million you speak of, but I could tell you over the last three budget cycles, there has been funding that the governor has asked for and, and appropriated uh, to not just Cal Fire, but the OES, uh, and in the CAL FIRE budget specifically that amplified uh, seasonal firefighters and extended the time that those firefighters could be um, uh, available. Uh, it increased by 13 engine companies, the number of firefighters uh, that maxed out or, or extended out those 13 engine companies. It increased uh, the number of aircraft and, and aircraft contracts that we had for, for call when needed or, or, or exclusive use uh, air, large air tankers. 
Uh, it increased uh, mitigation uh, of fire prevention um, uh, efforts that were in, uh, throughout the state of California. Um, and uh, it increased the overall emergency response fund that, um, you know, fires um, are now in the billions of dollars in responding to uh, to put these fires out. Um, and so um, some of that money went into that. And of course, at, at OES, it increased the, a number of fire engines that we turned around and, and uh, put into the mutual aid system. Um, the way the budgeting works, as the senator says, it's it's uh, sort of like over a course of time when you read the budget and you look, you know, specifically for 500 mil and something million. At one time, it could be uh, designated for Cal Fire in this budget, but moved to a different project that's uh, related. But it, it there's backfill to meet the requirements that uh, have been set forth. So um, uh, overall, if you if you look at the course of the last three budget cycles. Um, you'll, you'll be able to, to recognize the uh, uh, enhancements in the overall firefighting capability here in California. Um, Mary Jane O'Brien from Napa says, who's a lucky survivor of the LNU complex fire It burned within 15 feet of her back door. She says firefighters deserve to have a decent wage, not pay in budget cuts, which she perceives, I guess, that they're having, and to take away super tankers that saved our community. Is she, is she right on that? Or um, I think we would all agree. We, we would all agree that firefighters um, deserve a, 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 a decent wage, a livable wage, um, and they put their lives on the line for all of us. So I think we all are in agreement how important that is. Um, so yeah, I, I were, there, were there budget were there budget cuts that took away the super tankers? I don't think so. Can we correct that? You know, what, what also, you know, Bill, to Senator Dot to the previous question, in terms of some of the funding that's made available, there is a new helicopter in the region through the contract for service, the Chinook, which holds 2,800 gallons. So to the question of, I think it's not about taking away resources. I think they're replacing resources with more strategic resources that can be a little bit more surgical of how they can reach, you know, those hard to reach areas is the sense I'd get. But even at the local level, I think our funding for uh, fire departments has only grown. I, I don't think we've seen any clawback or any regression on the funding for local fire departments and also the relationship with Cal Fire. Good. And and as for the super tanker, sense. go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, Senator. Senator. Oh, go, go ahead, Senator. Well, I was just going to comment on the super tanker. I know that, uh, uh, you know, last year in, in, in Napa County, we saw that. In, also in Sonoma County, the previous two years, you know, there's uh, we we've had the unfortunate climate change just to, does not just impact the state of California. It impacts the state of Oregon, Washington, Montana. It impacts all the western states really, really uh, negatively for these wildfires. A lot of those federal government owned and lease super tankers. Uh, you know, we do have some uh, ability to uh, to have it. There's just not enough of them in the Western United States to do the type of job that we needed to do last year. I, I don't know, uh, Director Gilarducci, I think we had, you know, literally thousands of fires in the state of California going on at one time after those dry lightning strikes. That's, that's correct. That we, um, as we, if you all remember, we, we had a multi day, uh, literally a heat that uh, centered over. Uh, California, between Northern California, uh, and, uh, and several days of dry lightning. And that's where it ended up causing the LNU and the CZU, all these complex fires. They were all individual fires that burned together. They became a complex. Uh, and that's why in 2020, you know, was a devastating year. In fact, in 2020, um, you know, we made history in that uh, we had uh, 32 counties that fell under a federal major disaster declaration. Now, we've had major disaster declarations for fires before, but never 32 counties at the same time. So it was a pretty significant uh, state of uh, affairs. And uh, well, look, we, we have very large air tankers in the fleet. They, they have been funded. Um, the, the, the big 747 super tanker that you may be thinking about uh, was taken out of service by the owner and had to do with some certification issues. Um, and uh, it, look, if it was back in the mix, um, it was privately owned uh, unit contracted to the government, uh, we certainly would have it on fires today. 
uh, but we work to make up the difference through other kinds of air tankers and other uh, kinds of contract. Senator Dodd's 100% correct though. We don't have enough of these large air tankers. Uh, they are predominantly owned by uh, private uh, sector and they're contracted to the government. Uh, now recently, uh, uh, the state of California worked a, a deal with the, uh, the Department of Defense and, and, and the takeover uh, uh, several uh, Coast Guard uh, C-130s and, and repurpose them for firefighting. And we're in that process now of, of adding those seven C-130s to the California fleet uh, to be able to use for, uh, for firefighting uh, in the future. Uh, let me just close by saying, on the issue of pay for firefighters, um, there's no question that uh, all firefighters need to be paid uh, uh, and paid uh, well. Um, uh, our, our Cal firefighters and, and our local government firefighters are, are, have a very uh, good living wage. But um, uh, it is true that uh, during the course of the pandemic, uh, given the um, economic that the state was facing and all individuals were facing losing work or not being able to work, the governor uh, did uh, an edict across the board at state government uh, on a 10% pay cut for all state workers, that's uh, all state workers, including CAL FIRE, uh, for a period of uh, a year and uh, and recently has reinstated that plus uh, plus, plus a plus up um, to um, uh, uh, through their contractual agreement. So um, uh, lastly, the the U.S. Forest Service firefighters, which are federal firefighters, uh, uh, did not were not paid a very good wage. And recently, Governor Newsom did work very closely with the White House and the uh, and the USDA uh, secretary. Uh, to work to um, uh, increase their their pay rates to at least minimum wage, fifteen dollars an hour, uh, and uh, and they're now working with uh, with Congress to actually make that an increase moving in the future. So we agree with your assessment, and we'll continue to work at that to make sure those folks that are saving our property and risking their lives get what they need. Two minutes, ten seconds um, left. Okay, real quickly. Um, Randy and Angwin, do you have a uh, real quick question? I do. Uh, do you think that each county should own their own dedicated assets, i.e. airplanes and helicopters to assist CAL FIRE? And will you force CAL FIRE to accept and incorporate these assets as they have shown reluctance to do so? Thank, thank you, Randy. We've got about 30 seconds for the answer. Who'd like to take that? Well, I, I guess I <laughs> probably falls on me as well. Uh, look, um, we, 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 I'm not sure we uh, look to have uh, every county, uh, not every county needs aircraft. There are a lot of CAL FIRE state level aircraft, whether they're dedicated full-time aircraft owned by CAL FIRE or uh, under contract that are in place throughout the state strategically. Uh, having a lot of aircraft in the air uh, fighting fire is uh, important, but also uh, can be dangerous if it's not done uh, in a coordinated fashion. And, um, and and let me just say this, aircraft are important. One when minute. you have a problem, you can't really use aircraft. It's really the boots on the ground that make the big difference. And these are firefighters on the ground that we need moving forward. Thank you so much. That's about time for us. Um, thank you, uh, Director Mark Ilducci of the California Office of Emergency Services, Mary Bell Batcher, the President of the California Public Utilities Commission, and Alfredo Pedroza, Chair of the Napa County Board of Supervisors. Closing comments, Senator Dodd. Yes, you know, we're going to continue to have these wildfires. That's just evidence what we've seen so far this year. We're spending more money than we, we ever have. I think when I started in the legislature in 2015, our budget was about a mil, billion dollars a year, probably less. Today, we're three billion and focusing more and more on fire prevention. We'll continue along those lines. Appreciate uh, this great panel for taking time out of their personal schedules to be here tonight, busy schedules, nevertheless. And also to Rick, to you and KSVY for the wonderful job that you do and for all our viewing uh, uh, audience and for all the callers. Thank you all very much and good night. Thank you.